Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Well, Mark and I decided to put this slide uh, right at the beginning of this presentation because we think it summarizes uh, some of the challenges that we are nowadays facing when it comes to tall building design. As we can all appreciate, tall buildings are getting uh, taller and taller, often uh, more and more slender. And at the same time, the level of complexity of the architectural shape and forms is, is increasing. Now, some of these are, as you can probably appreciate, uh, uh, good ingredients for making uh, a vertical structure more wind sensitive. Now, when you look at this slide, um, you can probably see that every building is, 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 is rather different. Every building is rather unique from an architectural point of view. But they all seem to share, in a way or another, a, a common denominator. The design of the lateral stability system is often influenced, if not strongly influenced, I would say, uh, by what we call water shedding. Now, this, uh, this video is, uh, is a good representation of what uh, water shedding is. Uh, in this case, the profile of the tall building is spanning horizontally across the wind tunnel, and the wind is moving from uh, uh, the left to the right. And as you can see, what you have is a formation of a series of vortices. Uh, and this is uh, actually happening in an alternate fashion. And uh, this uh, um, unsteady, unsteady force is actually uh, inducing uh, uh, an excitation uh, in the tall building, which is uh, uh, trying to actually move uh, the building sideways, so perpendicular to the main direction of the wind. Now, when we take a look at the way the energy associated with this type of excitation vary with frequency, uh, in this particular case, we, we need to focus on the pink curve here, uh, what we notice is there's um, a localized area of energy, which are circled here in orange, uh, which is quite peculiar and is sitting in a relatively well-defined frequency, uh, once obviously you fixed your, your wind speed. And um, after that, the, the energy seems to decay quite rapidly, uh, more rapidly than uh, the way uh, the more kind of conventional and benign uh, uh, buffeting response does. Uh, as you can see, unfortunately, there's only a handful of uh, wind code which can actually provide uh, uh, designers with uh, analytical methods which are capable to essentially help them making prediction to the structure response to this type of excitation. And uh, although in those cases uh, uh, where we have uh, uh, available codes uh, telling us something about this water shedding, those models do seem to be primarily based on uh, very simple shapes. Uh, so square, rectangular shapes, uh, prismatic building, if you like, uh, which is currently not what we are designing. And we've seen the first slide. I mean, we are designing more this kind of cross section, this kind of shapes. So if we take a look and go back to the same representation where we have uh, energy plotted versus frequency, and we actually focus on some of these shapes down at the bottom, what we can see is this kind of uh, spread. There's a, there's a huge degree of variability here. Um, you can still notice that there is this localized area of energy. Um, the actual uh, width of uh, this uh, energy band varies as a function of the shape. In some cases, it'd be more narrow band. In some cases, it'd be more broad band. Uh, the slope varies as well. Uh, as you can see, the slope of the tail. Um, what is interesting to see is that this localized area of energy does tend to sit very much where uh, the first period of uh, uh, the super tall buildings we are currently designing are. Um, so you can see that there is a sort of parallelism between uh, um, the complexity of the shapes that we are actually working on and uh, the complexity of the response. And this is because this response is very much controlled by the shape. You change the shape and the shape can change, and the response can change. So, essentially, um, what, um, what this means is that uh, in order to actually de-risk uh, a project from, uh, from the very beginning, it's quite important to actually uh, get these buildings into the wind tunnel and actually um, uh, test them and actually develop solutions. And this is what we, uh, we've done here. I mean, uh, in the next uh, few slides, Mark will take you through a couple of uh, uh, case studies where we actually develop 
uh, together um, are dynamic solutions which uh, help reduce in uh, the response of these buildings. Okay, thank you very much for that, Stefano. Okay, um, in this next section, I'm just going to take you through from uh, a structural engineer's perspective uh, a couple of case studies that uh, that describe the way that we would typically go through uh, the series of wind tunnel testing uh, that's, that's typical for a lot of buildings. Um, the first project is a, is a Foster and Partners design tower um, adjacent to Al Faisalia in Riyadh. Uh, it's a 400 meter tower, uh, mixed use uh, with a hotel near the top and a, and a spa. Um, the structural system uh, was a, a concrete core system. Uh, we had uh, some exposed cores near the perimeter as well, all tied together with, uh, with outrigger structures. Uh, and due to its height, um, we ended up with, with quite long uh, periods of the building. Okay, um, as happens in a, in a lot of uh, projects, um, the form was set at quite an early stage. Um, the structural engineering followed suit uh, and was, was quite, uh, quite well set by the time we got to the wind tunnel. Um, with the primary uh, view of the wind tunnel testing to uh, to you know, extract results for the base overturning moments and also to look at the comfort criteria uh, and the accelerations due to wind. Okay, as you'll see on here, um, we had uh, a number of peaks. Uh, the most significant there at the, the 260 degree um, uh, wind angle, uh, which is almost uh, purely dynamic in, in characteristics uh, and led to quite high overturn in moments, but also uh, very high uh, accelerations as well. Uh, it's important to state that uh, with the system that was set up at the time, uh, the, the forces that, uh, that resulted, um, we could take those forces, but it was noted that we could perhaps be looking at uh, some form of amendments to the tower uh, to, to improve those results. And I think we've already uh, discussed this morning with, with Roy in particular about um, the, the impact of orientation of buildings, the impact of shape of buildings. One, the major uh, cause of the, the large dynamic crosswind acceleration uh, we felt was due to the exposed cores and the, the vortex shedding that we've already uh, discussed uh, at length this morning. Um, primarily coming from the 260 degree wind direction, uh, it was causing a lot of vortex shedding off these exposed cores. Um, so a second stage of wind tunnel testing, we went back in uh, and we decided to study the orientation of the building to see the impact of that. And the impact was that we found that by rotating the building just by 30 degrees, uh, we got quite considerable reduction in, in the overturning moments. Uh, and also importantly, we reduced the, the kind of dynamic uh, impact of, of that as well. So as a result, we were reducing overturning loads by around 30%. OK, um, what we found was that the ultimate limit state and also at serviceability limit state, the crosswind vortex shedding uh, was causing issues uh, for the tower. Um, but with this 30 degree rotation, uh, we determined that we could reduce overturning moments by 30%. We could reduce accelerations by 15%. All quite a fairly standard procedure in a wind tunnel and there's, I don't suppose there's anything new that we're telling you here in this system and uh, they were the results we got. Okay, one thing we did uh, pick up on was that with a more interactive approach, we felt that there would be further potential for looking at increasing uh, the base overturn and moment and the accelerations further. Okay, the, the second study that I'll take you through uh, again is a, a Foster and uh, Partners Tower. Um, this was on a very long and very narrow site in Istanbul, a high seismic zone. Um, due to the, uh, the length and the, the narrowness of the site, uh, we were uh, heavily influenced by accelerations and that was uh, driving uh, the design uh, to quite an extent, um, to such an extent that it was influencing the design as, as much as the, uh, the seismic was in, in that area. As a first stage, um, Fosters wanted to investigate uh, different shapes before they, they you know, formed on the, the final scheme for the project. So at concept stage, we went into the wind tunnel with three predefined building shapes. 
uh, just to look at the performance of each of those. Uh, and we also wanted to see with the, the middle option there, uh, they wanted to investigate the potential for, for harness and wind energy in, in those zones as well. So we went into the tunnel with that, uh, with that in mind. Due to the slenderness of the building, again, we've got quite long periods. Okay, from those results, it was actually determined that the, the middle option of the, the, the twin uh, tower structure was, was the most op optimum. Um, so again, we decided to have a, have a further look at optimization of the, of the form, uh, to look at the, the influence of the two towers upon one another. So we looked at the separation of those towers. We also looked at the separation of the sky bridges as well. Uh, the distance of the sky bridges apart from each other, the number of sky bridges, the size of those sky bridges, just to see the influence of those. But again, this is from a predetermined series of options uh, with very little flexibility at that stage. It was uh, determined that one of the, the principal things, as discussed earlier, was the vortex shedding. Um, so again, we went into the wind tunnel for a third time. Uh, this time uh, to look at shaping of the corners and how they influence. And again, we've, we've discussed that this morning and it's been discussed quite a lot through the conference, uh, the impact of disrupting the flow uh, to reduce vortex shedding. Again, we looked at a, a predetermined number of options and you'll see there's a common theme here. We're going into the wind tunnel at stage after stage to look at predetermined options uh, in uh, a not very interactive manner. And then at the final stage, once we determined our, our separation of the towers, we determined our optimum uh, size of the uh, of size and spacing of the, the sky bridges. And we went into the tunnel again uh, with the full surrounds to determine the final loading uh, for design. Okay, I'll hand over. Thanks, Mark. Well. Um after having gone through this, uh, we thought, well, uh, maybe, maybe we can actually uh, improve something here. Um, if, you, uh, if you were at the last year conference in uh, Seoul, uh, you might remember a presentation uh, uh, given by my colleague, Dr. Volker Butkereit. And uh, during that presentation, he, he, he basically brought up this concept of uh, building uh, uh, envelope optimization study. Uh, which is something that uh, we definitely consider here. We took the spirit of that, we took the uh, philosophy of that, and uh, all we wanted to do is essentially had uh, an additional dimension to this, which was uh, uh, trying to control uh, the structural system uh, more directly uh, during the actual uh, wind tunnel testing. Essentially, what we would like to do here is uh, uh, being able to almost uh, uh, simultaneously uh, playing with uh, these three items which I highlighted in, uh, in yellow. Uh, we know that there, are, there is benefit in uh, uh, reorienting the tower in most of the cases. There is benefit in changing the shape and there is benefit in uh, uh, tweaking and fine tuning the structure. And all these, uh, um, these things can actually happen uh, during the wind tunnel test. There's no reason why not. Um, what we are talking about here, in term, especially in terms of shape, is not actually looking at uh, a series of uh, uh, predefined shape, but it's very much a question of uh, uh, developing those shapes directly in the wind tunnel and fine-tuning the structure uh, while uh, we are actually learning about the aerodynamics of, uh, uh, of these uh, tall and super tall buildings. And this is the way uh, Essentially, the, the Building Aerodynamics Interactive Workshop uh, uh, works. Um, we need to start setting up some criteria here. Um, they can be acceleration criteria, they can be criteria uh, dictated by the structure engineer. Perhaps he's interested in turning uh, a super tall tower uh, into a seismic control uh, problem uh, and therefore kind of forgetting almost about uh, the wind problem. And, um, and then what we need to do is essentially define a baseline condition, a baseline shape, uh, and uh, at the same time uh, uh, define uh, a baseline structural system. So we can do a thorough investigation, uh, which is typically done uh, by testing this building uh, for 36, if not more, wind directions. 
and then the data can get analyzed, so we get a good understanding of how the aerodynamic works. And then we are entering this interactive session, which is, uh, as you can probably appreciate, uh, going to be very much focused on uh, a, a limited number of uh, critical uh, uh, wind directions. Uh, we can modify the high frequency force balance relatively easily. Uh, that can be tested again. Uh, we can actually reorient the tower if it's required. We can change the structural properties because uh, uh, the structure engineers can actually come up with a relatively simplified structural model uh, which allows uh, uh, mass distribution and stiffness distribution to be finely tuned according to what we see happening. And then uh, essentially what we do is uh, keep on iterating between these options until essentially the, the criteria is met. So what we did was, uh, uh, once this uh, project was uh, uh, pretty much finished, we said, why, why not going back and revisit this project a little bit? And uh, um, together with the structure engineers, we started actually playing a little bit with the shape of this, and at the same time, uh, uh, fine-tuning the structure, uh, following what we were actually finding. Some of these modifications that we introduced here are primarily aimed at understanding which was the portion of the tower which was very much controlling water shedding. So after a little bit of investigation, we were immediately able to actually uh, tell that the shape of uh, uh, the spa, which is this structure supported by the three mega cores, and the actual profile of uh, uh, the enforced concrete mega, mega, mega cores there, uh, wasn't that important for, for water shedding. What was controlling water shedding was very much the shape of uh, the cores and uh, the, the width of uh, the, the tower around the hotel section. So the lesson that we learned from this one was uh, essentially that by uh, fine-tuning uh, uh, the, the width uh, of uh, the hotel section and changing the shape uh, of the cores around that portion of the building, and at the same time adjusting in parallel uh, the period of the structure and, and the mass distribution accordingly, we were able to reduce uh, the response associated with crosswind response by up to 10-15% and in parallel reducing also the accelerations. So just to conclude, um, we've seen from this presentation and from the previous two presentations how important was the shedding is when, in, when we're actually designing these tall and super tall buildings. And at the same time we actually realized uh, that uh, you know, there is so much that codes of practice can actually do because of this complexity of uh, uh, architectural forms we are working with. And uh, therefore engaging uh, uh, wind tunnel testing early on is, 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 is becoming very much paramount for these type of structures. And, uh, and this is uh, already happening. And um, often uh, um, we have the opportunity to actually test multiple predefined shapes in the wind tunnel, uh, which is great, um, but we felt at some point that there was somewhat limiting ourselves, and this is why we wanted to take a, a, a sort of step forward and uh, essentially try to actually bring together the architectural, um, the architectural team and uh, the structure engineering team in the wind tunnel and actually develop uh, aerodynamic solutions and develop structural solutions which were ultimately able to deliver uh, a system which was working. Thank you very much. <laughs>